1846, in his book, Diseases of the Uterus, M. Lefranc wrote, During the catamenia and some days before and after, the neck of the uterus is more voluminous and softer to the touch. Also at these times, it is ordinarily enough dilated to admit the last phalanx of the forefinger. If it is dilated at other times, it is not, according to Hippocrates, in a healthy state. It is already, or on the point of being, attacked by a grave affection. A few years later, the medical profession was performing a common operation for sterility and dysmenorrhea. It was a simple procedure. It consisted simply of splitting the cervix from side to side and packing the wound open to prevent its reapproximation. After performing this operation for many years, Dr. Thomas Addis Emmett, in 1862, noted a remarkable similarity in its end result and the appearance of the services of many women who had borne children. He thus became the first man in history to recognize and describe a cervical laceration. Reporting on his discovery before the Medical Society of the County of New York, and as recorded in Volume 1 of the Journal of Obstetrics of 1869, he said, I have long since abandoned the operation, for, in fact, I have been unable to recall a single instance where inflammatory symptoms have not subsequently occurred. Ten years later, in 1879, in his textbook, Principles and Practices of Gynecology, Dr. Emmett devoted considerable space to a discussion of cervical laceration. He wrote, Until recently, laceration was usually mistaken for ulceration. To heal this so-called ulceration would long baffle every mode of treatment. Relapse would follow again and again. Such a case passed from one physician to another until eventually the leucorrhea ceased and the profuse menstruation diminished, as the services from frequent application of caustics or the cautery became psychiatrical in nature. Nevertheless, a woman in this condition gradually became a confirmed invalid. He further said, From my standpoint, I cannot but denounce an amputation with scissors, knife, or cautery. I also deprecate as even more uncalled for the application of cautery or caustics to heal a so-called ulceration. He concluded his lengthy chapter with these words. To those who are familiar with this subject, it would not seem as if it had been treated of to an extent beyond its merits. Its importance cannot be exaggerated, since at least one half the ailments among those who have born children are to be attributed to lacerations of the cervix. The test of time has verified Dr. Emmett's observations. The transverse slit-like appearance of the multiparous cervix, so characteristic that it is accepted in courts of law as positive proof that parturition has taken place, is convincing proof that lacerations always occur with the first child. Fortunately, not all lacerations lead to inflammatory changes. Generally, only those extensive enough to freely admit the examining finger, as observed by Lefranc in 1846, and according to him known to Hippocrates, are subject to pathological processes. A few facts of basic physiology and anatomy will help to explain why this is so. The virgin cervix is a circular organ with a small, centrally placed stoma, the external cervical os. Its spindle-shaped canal is lined with mucus-secreting cells. These cells fill the canal with an alkaline mucus plug, which is retained by the small external os. This plug serves as a seal and a barrier to ascending infection. The displacement of the mucus plug is a recognized sign of cervical effacement during labor. As labor progresses, the canal and its small external os must be sufficiently dilated to permit the passage of a full-term fetus. The wonder is not that lacerations always occur with the first child, but that pathological lacerations do not occur more frequently. When involution is complete, 
six weeks to three months later, examination reveals the extent of the damage done. In a high percent of cases, the canal is no longer spindle-shaped, but cone-shaped, with the large end of the cone facing the vagina. The cervical cells still secrete mucus, but with the external loss destroyed, it is no longer retained and a discharge develops. To make matters worse, the cervical cells normally bathed in the alkaline media of their own secretion are now left unprotected and exposed to the acid secretions of the vagina. They become irritated and inflamed and infected and eroded. Regional adenopathy and ascending infection follow with the concomitant signs of leucorrhea, backache, dragging feeling in the lower abdomen, menstrual irregularity, low-grade fever, nervousness, and irritability. It is easy to understand why Dr. Emmett wrote that fully one-half of the ailments a woman complains of following childbearing are due to lacerations of the cervix. Many have questioned the connection between laceration and malignant change. Yet, if chronic inflammation is accepted as a forerunner of carcinoma, then cervical laceration as an underlying cause of chronic inflammation must be accepted as a possible factor in the development of malignant change. In over 400 consecutive biopsies at the Condell Memorial Hospital since 1948, abnormal tissue was found in every case. Reason dictates that if laceration is the cause of pathological changes, then the treatment would not be cauterization, coagulation, or amputation, but simply a repair of the laceration. The objective of any such repair should be the restoration of the mucus plug. With it and the natural protective mechanisms of the body, irritation and inflammation and infection will subside. No tampon, no medicament made is so conducive to the establishment of normalcy in the cervix as the cervical cells bathed in the alkaline media of their own secretion held in place by a small external loss. The operation devised by Dr. Emmett has not stood the test of time, for he failed to recognize the importance of the mucus plug. His concept was merely to approximate the cervical lips. He even emphasized the necessity of flaring out the denudation to avoid making too small a stoma. Today, the slight modification of the Emmett repair, as pictured in nearly every textbook of surgery, gynecology, and obstetrics, shows widely separated areas of denudation giving graphic evidence of this same disregard of the mucus plug and of the importance of the external cervical loss which retains it. In the operation described in this monograph, the areas of denudation are turned inward. A narrow one-half centimeter bridge of intact mucosa is left anteriorly and posteriorly to serve as the borders of the new external loss. Substantial bites are taken high in the cervical substance and the needle is directed through the areas of denudation. Superficial sutures are taken as well to ensure that the denuded area is approximated to denuded area. Triple sulfa cream is used to prevent bacterial disintegration of the sutures during the healing period. The operation can be performed during the childbearing years for the laterally placed scars offer no obstruction to subsequent labors. Of course, subsequent labors may require additional repairs, though the incidence of this is considerably less than the number necessary following first labors. In the meantime, the patient is free of the distressing symptoms and dangers of a cervical laceration.